Welcome back to BBC World News America. The earthquake which struck Japan today ranks as one of the most powerful anywhere in the world in the past century. And tonight, the full extent of the damage still is not clear. But scientists are busy looking for answers beneath the ocean floor. And the BBC's David Shukman has more on what triggered today's deadly quake. To give you a sense of scale, the explosive energy released was 8,000 times greater than in the recent earthquake at Christchurch in New Zealand. And the effects are still emerging. In the distance, a first terrifying sight of the huge wave surging inland. Literally nothing can stop it. Houses are just crushed. First came the earthquake, now the tsunami. This is a double disaster, and even the large building in the foreground is destroyed in an instant. According to this official, the waves did not decrease in size. They kept coming, and the cycle lasted for about an hour. Japan is all too familiar with earthquakes. Each of these dots marks a quake of magnitude 7 or more since 1900. And here's the site of today's quake, the country's worst on record. Now, this is the reason. The fault lines that run nearby, they divide some highly active tectonic plates with the Pacific plate moving westwards. As it goes, it's being forced down. And a sudden jolt triggers the tsunami, lifting the ocean floor and the great mass of seawater above it. The fault has broken along a line hundreds of kilometres long, uh, tens of kilometres wide, and all that amount of land has suddenly moved uh, by several metres. Uh, that's an enormous amount of movement. It's an enormous amount of energy. The waves surging across the Pacific led to a full alert. Dozens of countries feared they'd be devastated. But as each hour has passed and the tsunami has reached further, there have been no reports of damage beyond Japan so far. And due to the tsunami, there's been many people who went missing. There have been lucky escapes. This fishing vessel somehow survived the waves. And there have been some very disturbing sights. A giant whirlpool and a small boat caught inside it. Now, the tsunami is still on its way to the shores of South America. The authorities there are urging people to move inland or at least be aware of the risk. But it's clear that Japan has borne the brunt of this catastrophe and its impact is still unfolding. Terrifying images there and David Shukman reporting. And as David mentioned, Japan is no stranger to powerful earthquakes. Over the past century, major seismic events there have killed hundreds of thousands and caused billions of dollars in damage. The BBC's Philippa Young has that story. The Great Kanto Earthquake, the worst in Japanese history, hit the Kanto Plain around Tokyo in 1923. It killed more than 140,000 people. Tokyo was devastated. The port city of Yokohama was reduced to rubble. High winds whipped the flames from cooking fires. They quickly became firestorms, which claimed more lives than the quake itself. 1948 and three and a half thousand people died after another quake hit Fukui, close to Kyoto. 1964's Niigata earthquake was more powerful, yet claimed far fewer lives. It's estimated fewer than 30 people were killed. In January 1995, devastation in Kobe. Six and a half thousand people died, more than 400,000 were injured. 100,000 homes were completely destroyed. Every earthquake has had its legacy. Kobe prompted another investment in technology, building techniques and transport safety measures in early warning and search and rescue operations. Japan, hit by one in five of the world's earthquakes, is a country which has had to learn from bitter experience and one which is using it to fight its hardest against nature. Philippa Young, BBC News. Well, Japan is no stranger to earthquakes, but as you saw, this really was an extraordinary one. Our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh, is here. Um, just let's talk, first of all, about this nuclear reactor. It sounds like there is a, a pretty worrying situation going on there. It could be worrying. The situation is that we have a nuclear reactor where the pressure is building up because there's a problem with the cooling system. The authorities want to relieve that pressure by venting steam from the cooling system. The problem is that that steam could be radioactive. The Japanese nuclear authorities are playing the situation down, saying that uh, if it is radioactive, it's probably only slightly radioactive. It poses no risk to human health 
or the environment, but we will have to wait and see if that really is the case. And in terms of the earthquakes themselves, Japan has, what, hundreds every year? Well, that's right. The entire Pacific Rim region is known as the Ring of Fire. And this illustration uh, will show you. It just shows that red line shows where the Earth's tectonic plates meet. And when they rub up against each other, you get volcanic activity and, of course, earthquakes. Now, let's just zoom in towards Japan. And what you'll see is that that region has even more tectonic plates than, than normal. It's, uh, lots of them rubbing up against each other, which is why, as you say, there are hundreds of earthquakes each year, but they, many of them barely register. But on this occasion, there was a sudden large jolt, which led to the country having its largest earthquake ever. And it seems that the tsunami is what has done the, the most destruction. Most people who have died are feared to have drowned. Well, that's right. Now, the tsunami is caused when these plates actually connect together. One slips underneath the other, and that raises the seabed up. That, in turn, raises the water up, we can see from this illustration. And that results in a giant tidal wave that we call a tsunami. It's different from a normal wave in that it travels so fast, nearly 500 miles an hour, until it hits land. And then it can rise up even further. As you said, three storeys high, that high. And it can, uh, sur as we've seen in Robert Hall's report, it can surge well into the land for, for several miles, causing huge devastation. Uh, there, there have never been pictures that have been captured quite like it in, in the, the moment. And what have seismologists been saying about it? Well, seismologists have been relieved that the tsunami hasn't uh, spread to other parts of the world. This giant tidal wave has spread all across the world, and the worry was that we'd get a repeat of what happened in 2004. Uh, that that's not happened, and uh, they've said that uh, th they're relieved that that's the case. The fault has broken along a line hundreds of kilometres long, uh, tens of kilometres wide, and all that amount of land has suddenly moved uh, by several metres. Uh, that's an enormous amount of movement. It's an enormous amount of energy. That was a huge amount of energy that's uh, been released. At the moment, it's caused great devastation in Japan. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to have caused the same devastation that we've been expecting Palab in other parts of the world. OK, Palab Ghosh, thank you very much. Well, for more on just what triggered today's deadly quake and the science behind the plates which are shifting, we're joined now by John Ebel. He's a seismologist at Boston College's Western Observatory who is in Huntsville, Alabama for us tonight. John, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, first of all, I explain something about the scale of earthquakes to me, because I had always assumed that earthquakes went on the Richter scale 6, 7, 8, and went up, you know, that 7 was a little bit stronger than 6, and 8 was a bit stronger than 7, but that's clearly not the case. Well, the, the Richter scale is, de is designed so that as you go up one unit of magnitude, you go up a factor of 10 in terms of the size of the waves. So as you go from 7 to 8, the waves are 10 times stronger. It turns out as you get above 8, the waves don't get a great deal stronger, but instead the seismic waves last longer and longer. So the reports coming out of Japan, very consistent with an 8.9 earthquake, of strong ground shaking lasting literally a couple minutes, two to three minutes. It's been a very busy week seismologically, clearly in Japan, and before this huge quake, there were a series of what have been called foreshocks. Um, you're suggesting that there are periods in history when certain tectonic plates are particularly busy. Well, what we've seen in the past is from 1946 to 1964, there were a series of earthquakes uh, in Alaska, 1960, magnitude 9. Uh, 9. Uh, 1964, magnitude 9.2. Chile, 1960, 9.5. Uh, Kamchatka, uh, 9.0 in 1952. A series of earthquakes, uh, upper magnitude 8s to low magnitude 9s. Between 1964 and 2000, for a period of 40 years, no earthquake on the globe larger than about magnitude 8.3, 8.4. Suddenly, we have the great tsunami and earthquake in the Indian Ocean in 2004 and 8.7 in 2005, 8.8 .8 in 2010 off Chile, and now 8.9 off Japan uh, today. And so what we're seeing is suddenly a spate of strong earthquakes again. And what How can we learn, John, last... from that? I mean, what can, we, what can we learn from the history of these patterns? Does it suggest to you that we are 
in the middle of a spate of seismic activity? Are we now at the end of it, or can we just not know? Uh, there's no way to predict when these, these periods of intense seismic activity might end, but what they do indicate is that there is a potential for additional strong earthquakes uh, in the major tectonic plate boundaries where we have subduction. So Alaska, Central South America, and the Southwest Pacific, as well as Indonesia. So which countries around that ring would you be looking at with a certain amount of caution, given what's happened in New Zealand and in Japan just in the last couple of weeks? I wish I knew. I would say uh, any of the south, uh, western side of South America, Central America, uh, the Pacific Northwest of the United States, Alaska, the Aleutian Islands, and then down to the Philippines and, and other parts of Japan all have the potential for uh, future major earthquake activity. Okay, John Evil joining us there from Alabama. Thank you so much, John. You're welcome. And still to come here on BBC World News America, Japan declares its first nuclear emergency. Thousands are evacuated after the earthquake causes one reactor's cooling system to fail. It's been three months now since Haiti was devastated by a massive earthquake which left hundreds of thousands of people dead and scores more homeless. It was a natural disaster which hit without warning. But what if something could be done to actually alert people before an earthquake strikes? Well, that's exactly what a scientist in California is trying to do using volunteers and their laptops. From California, Rajesh Merchandani now reports. In cutting edge California, People are rarely without their computers. Maybe she's starting up the next Google. Maybe he's writing an Oscar-winning screenplay. Or maybe they're part of an earthquake early warning system. This one is vertical motion. And then if I shake it the other way, you'll see. This scientist wants to use something called an accelerometer that's built into many laptops. It's used to detect movement. She's out giving demonstrations hoping to recruit 10,000 quake catchers. A lot of uh, laptops have accelerometers in them. Basically, if I drop my laptop on the ground, it's supposed to stop the hard drive and sort of save the computer. Um, and so I figured that since there's already an accelerometer in there, we could use it to record earthquakes. A lot of readings from one area distinguish an earthquake from a lesser jolt. As long as the computer's on, the software is sending data in real time back to a central server. The idea is when a big tremor strikes, thousands of laptop sensors can cheaply and instantly collect a lot of information. And if scientists can pinpoint quickly where an earthquake starts, they might be able to send out a warning to places further away. In Haiti in January, a few seconds warning might have given people vital time to get out of poorly constructed buildings. California has its own experience of earthquakes. Oh, gosh! Scientists here carefully study what happens so buildings can be constructed to withstand the big quake they say is overdue. California has a network of high-tech sensors in undisturbed locations. They're expensive and an early warning system here is years off. This one's a, what we call a shake movie. A leading seismologist says data from laptop sensors lacks detail but can still help. The more that we get Southern California to see that we are a seismically active community and we all have a role to play in being safer, the safer we're all going to be. So I think that the, that just the social aspect of it would make it completely worth it whatever the seismologic uses of it. Hey there. Can I show you this? Back at the cafe, people seem impressed. It's California, come on. There's one big quake every 30 years or something, so it's, it's important, I think. That is brilliant, especially in a place like Southern California. This would come in very handy. I mean, we'd actually, we'd actually use it. When it comes to understanding earthquakes, could future safety be based on today's popular technology? Rajesh Merchandani, BBC News in Los Angeles.